Hello and welcome to uh, the newest episode of the Lost Boys podcast. I'm Todd Tandy Anderson, and I'm joined by friends Braden Bowdish and David Nunez. Uh, Braden and David, how are you? How are you doing? Let's start with Braden. What's up, man? I'm crushing it. Uh, Wakanda is great. The new announcements are fun. I'm, I might be flying to Georgia. Flying to Georgia? Fun. I mean, I might be flying too. David, how are you doing, yeah. buddy? I'm doing pretty good. I actually already knew I was flying to Atlanta for SCG Atlanta, so I've had oh. that fl- flight book since December. <laughs> You're just going to have to run it back, hit it a second time, right? Or is it yeah, at SCG Atlanta? Is that what's happening? Or is it at No, a- it's, it's uh, like two weeks later for the ah. uh, official event. Are you gonna Are you gonna do the stay at a hotel for two weeks in Atlanta instead of flying back? Or no, I don't have the PTO <laughs> for that. <laughs> uh, so uh, for those of you who uh, don't know who these two people are, uh, Braden Bowdish, a former employee at uh, Star City Games, now works for uh, Tales of Adventure um, and uh, has multiple top eights uh, at the SEG's uh, SEG Con weekends. They have one Ks and five thousand dollar opens, and Braden has uh, what three top eights now? Yeah, I have three top eights across the three events I've gone to. Excellent. And uh, what's your favorite deck to play at home, just so people know? Uh, right now it's Amber Steel. I, I've, Amber yes. Steel has been like my go-to color since set twos, and uh, I've been really enjoying just playing the queen and shifting and casting Holy World. It's great. Now, David, I know that you actually just had some recent success at one of these 1K events and actually won the one on Sunday, the last day of SCG Con in Philadelphia at the Valley Forge. Uh, what deck were you playing, and is that your favorite deck? Uh, I was playing Emerald Amethyst. Uh, I think it's probably my current favorite deck. Uh, my previous two SCG Cons that I had gone to, I had played Amber Amethyst, uh, so that deck will always have a special place in my heart, but I think it's less well positioned right now. Well, David is no slouch himself. Uh, plenty of top eights and uh, a road warrior going to be traveling to a lot of events coming up. So keep an eye out for his name in the standings. Uh, and of course I'm Tandy. Uh, I played for a long time in the magic, the gathering sphere. I have some trophies over here. You may know me uh, from writing for StarCityGames.com. If you don't know me, I put on the Lost Boys Lorcana Invitational at Apex Gaming uh, back in October with with Chapter 1 when it came out uh, alongside some other members of the Lost Boys. And I'm excited to start the project back up again. I've, I've been missing Lorcana, but I've been really enjoying it since uh, Set 3 uh, came out. Braden, give me your, your thoughts on Set 3 so far. Uh, I think it gave a lot of decks in the format tools to adjust to the metagame, and so there's been a lot more metagame churn over the last uh, few weeks, which is really great. feels like every weekend there's a deck to beat, and it's not the same deck week to week. also feels like a lot of the decks are very skill-intensive. You see decks that are not very popular being top-aided by different players who are just kind of broken at work just on it. Just that good, yeah. And that's... That's like a. I think that's great. It, it gives you something to, to aspire to. Like, oh, if I get really good at this deck, maybe I'll start top baiting. And I think that's awesome. David, what's your opinion? Are are you a fan of this constructed format for set three? Uh, I've been a big fan of this constructed format. Um, in previous formats, uh, the colors weren't all like very equally represented. Some of them just like did not have almost any level of success. And so seeing Emerald and Sapphire be successful in set three has uh, like brought a lot of depth to the metagame. Yeah, I mean, I was always just looking for something to ramp into with old Mickey Mouse uh, Detective, and uh, right now it seems like Sapphire looks pretty sweet. Looking forward to doing a lot of testing since I basically played it zero when I was playing Chapter 1 Constructed. But enough with the introductions now that uh, those are out of the way. We had some extremely big news today from Disney Ravensburger about Lorcana Chapter 4. It's the Revenge of Ursula. She's coming in to wreck up the place. Uh, A lot of card reveals happen, but more importantly for us, the tournament grinders. We got to look at what organized play is going to be. Braden, why don't you give us a rundown of what they announced today? So uh, there are going to be several large events all over the world. Uh, For North America, which is where the three of us are from, they announced an event in uh, Georgia and an event in Chicago. Uh, Those events uh, will somehow feed into some world championship. and those events are going to, uh, co- they are right after the release of set four. So they're just a few months away in May. And uh, there are some new rules with them, which we can get into if we're ready. Uh, we'll get into them in just a minute. Uh, was there anything uh, from today, David, that caught your eye in terms of uh, cool announcements outside of the tournament related stuff? Because they showed off some really cool new cards, but they also showed off some really sweet prizes for these uh, big open events that they're going to be having at all these uh, big weekends. 
Yeah, um, they posted prizes uh, for going just for being in attendance. Uh, there's a very cool looking dragon fire. Yeah. Um, and then there's additional prizes for uh, top 64, top 16, top four, top 32 as well, I think. So, um, you know, just, you know, cards that'll be like a memorable story if you manage to win one. And I think they're going to be pretty valuable. If you look at the promos from every other event that's happened so far, for example, the PAX promos, uh, those Mickey, not the Mickeys, the uh, the Pinocchios uh, were like $50 at one point recently. And you, I think you just got them for like buying any amount of product or maybe like a booster box or something. So uh, there were a lot of those at that event. At a certain point, they just started handing them out if you were playing in any of the <laughs> official events. I remember so that. So if you just show up and you play in one of these uh, big events, these uh, championships, you're going to get a uh, dragon fire. And even if dragon fire isn't the staple it used to be in set one, I think these promos just have such a mass appeal to Disney fans that they're going to be worth quite a bit. They're, they're going to pay for, for some amount of your trip. I, I would bet maybe not the whole thing, but yeah. you know, I think some of those know. promos, you know, there's a, a Rapunzel for top 16 that has a brand new yeah. art that looks fire. And uh, I imagine that one's going to be worth uh, have a, a pretty penny and uh, going to help refund some costs. So the prizes actually look pretty good. And I'm, I'm excited to see exactly what they are uh, in the secondary market, because as far as we know, the promos are the only prizes. And that's a little bit scary. But at the same time, the collectability of this game seems to be uh, in a good spot. And these special promos that they're giving look like they're going to be desirable. Yeah, I just want to add one thing. Yeah. Uh, one really cool thing about this, and it's kind of a question I've had, like, why is it that some cards get enchanted and other cards don't get enchanted? It's like, uh, there's just been some like weird which cards get what, and we're seeing that a lot of cards that got skipped on enchanted in early sets are getting enchanted as their promos for these events. So uh, one example is there's like a super rare Brave Little Tailor. Up to this point, the most fancy version of Brave Little Tailor, not very, not a very powerful constructed card, but the only fancy version was a cold foil, which is like a hundred dollars, which is mm-hmm. crazy if you think about it, because that card sees no constructed play. But now there's going to be an enchanted of that card. There's going to be like four of them for every uh, top four, I think. So that card's going to be. Brayden, it's, it's not even heard. just. It's it's also. I don't know if you saw. They they talked about it a little bit. It's going to be a gold foil. Yeah, that, and it's going to be an absurdly expensive. It it looks cool. Yeah. I think they said that it looks really cool in paper, and they did not show the art because. Of an image of it does not do it justice, and they want to be like showing it on the big screen when they show it for the first time. So, kudos yeah. to them. That's going to be a pretty fun reveal. Uh, now let's get well, to the let's get to the mean potatoes of, of what we're going to be talking about today. The elephant in the room uh, for competitive players. Uh, we are moving uh, from best of three to best of two, at least for the bulk of the days. And what that mean? Uh, what that means is that uh, when you sit down and play someone, you're going to be playing not a best of three. You're going to be playing two total games against them, and your points awarded will be as such. If you win zero games, zero points. If you win one of the two games, you get one point. If you win both games, you get three points. It's essentially removing an entire game from uh, you know the the pool of games that you're that are being played, but I, I honestly don't know how this is going to affect the tournament ecosystem. So, David, I know that you got a lot to say about this. You've been really thinking about it and crunching the numbers. So, why don't you give me uh, whatever brute force take you have about best of two as the new constructed uh, competitive format for Disney's Locana? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I have a lot of experience in other trading card games, and especially uh, in the Twitter sphere of Pokemon. The discussion of playing best of two has been in the hive mind for a while Uh, because Pokemon in Japan, where the cards are designed, is played as a 30 minute best of one. Uh, But, you know, internationally on the the larger scale, it's played as a 50 minute best of three. So if a game is designed to take 25 to 30 minutes, it's very difficult or almost extraordinarily impossible to play a full three games in 50 minutes. Mm. So that's a solution that has been proposed for Pokemon, but never adopted. So this uh, best or best of two or two game strategy um, does some things in terms of uh, like what your expectations are as a player. So uh, I recently posted to Twitter and my Facebook, uh, I had played eight events of the 1K prize structure or higher across the three SCGs that I went to. And I had a 56 match sample size of uh, games that I played. 
So um, I could look at like what happened in games where I went first and what happened in games where I went second. And uh, so Pavel, the creator of Pixelborn, has uh, released some stats about uh, whether a player is more likely to win going first or going second and what the disparity is. And uh, my disparity, or like perceived over the course of those matches, was even greater than uh, what they had posted about as being the online numbers. So I, I experienced being north of 70% when I was going first in the game and being much closer to 50, maybe 52, 54% in a game where I went second. So uh, that's very large. Uh, and moving from a system where I can win a die roll and get two games on the play versus a system where I'm always going to play one game on the play and one game on the draw uh, means that there won't be matches where I get two games on the play. I'm always going to be one game going first, one game going second. That's an excellent point. Uh, One thing that I I think I want to note also is that while uh, one and one, like finishing one and one in your match does kind of feel like a draw, like you each get a point, uh, it's not going to be uh, exactly the same because fewer people are going to be getting three points. And so you're just going to have a, a larger clog of single point earners over the course of the first, you know, X rounds or whatever. And it just means that if you 2 0 a lot in a row, you start to break away from the pack in like a significant way. And uh, I really like that each game kind of counts as its own little thing as well. Um, the big issue for me is that best of three on average is just not finishing the rounds in time in a way that I think is uh, fixable in the game engine. The game engine is built in such a way already where some games can last over 30 minutes and it's just a normal game. And you get to uh, some matchups that are specifically grindy, like the Ruby Amethyst Mirrors from Chapter 1. I know it's a little bit different now with Goad and other ways to gain a lot of lore, but it used to be that the games in the Ruby Amethyst Mirror would take sometimes 50 minutes for one for one single game, sometimes more. And that's just something that's not sustainable long term. And so I think the best of one uh is superior but it comes with its own complications as well because best of one specifically means that if you're at the tournament you're going to have to get repaired every 30 minutes and there's always five to ten minutes of downtime when you do that pairing not to mention some people still going to go to time because people just play glacially slow or or tough matchups so um yeah i'm, I'm right there with there's, you go, go ahead Brent. there's also there's also the variance of best of one where unless you're making sure that everyone's playing the same number of games on the play and on the draw, you're going to run into issues where some people get just they high roll and they go six games in a row where they're best of one and going first, where if you, with this system, uh, there are some advantages to being the person who decides when they're going to go first or, or second, but other, otherwise, besides that, you're really neutralizing a lot of the advantages that come from uh, being on the play uh, in this game, at least. Yeah, an even number of games on the play and draw is uh, a goal that many aspire to in terms of game design. And the best of two feels a little strange to those of us who played best of three in other games. But the the long and short of it is that the games take longer and a best of three is not sustainable. And so you have to find some way around it. And if best of one is something that everyone's uh, repulsed by and you find this happy medium with best of two, I think that that's pretty great. I personally don't really like the idea of a two O being weighted so heavily versus uh, a one in one, uh, especially because, you know, there's only so many games you can play in a day before, you just run out of time, run out of daylight. But uh, it's very difficult to go 2-0, I think, in uh, this game. And being on the play mat does matter a lot. So I think you're just going to have a ton. Like, we have the possibility every round that every single game is a 1-1, right? That's just, like, something that's possible. So it is technically possible, but um, you would expect about 25, uh, 50% of matches to go 1-1 and 50% of matches to go where one player wins both games. Right. Um, it's not exactly as clean as that because, um, like if there are unintentional draws or, um, like uh, there are like other factors that would limit it from being perfectly that way, but, um, you generally would expect about a 50, 50 split. 
Right. You would expect a 50 50 split if it was, uh, you know, 50 50 in terms of winning on the player, the draw. But it, it, does, is it the same if it's a 75 25 if you're going first? And then does that mean that the person that's on the play will just win the majority of the time? And if, and if you start boarding on 80 percent, 90 percent, you know, then you just get a whole bunch of ties. And so there, there's definitely some, some potential problems there. Obviously the better players will find strategies that can break serve on the draw. We'll, we're going to be, hitting the the streets pretty hard in terms of looking for technology you know as as the new sets come out and things like that but uh i'm i'm optimistic about this tournament structure but i'm i'm certainly pretty scared of it brayden how do you feel about it uh i feel good i think there's like some interesting cultural things that stem from like new uh structures of like matches right so for example uh in let's say you're playing like a six round event and you go uh, 2-0 for the first four games in a row, uh, you can just concede, like, based off the math, you basically can just concede to your opponents every round for the rest of the, of the event, and then you will top eight. So there's just weird stuff like that where, like, hey, you can, that already works. If you go 4-0 in a six-round event, best of three, you can just intentionally draw the last two rounds. Oh, but, so they're going to have to toy with the structures a little bit, probably, to prevent those types of things from happening. Maybe an extra well, round here or one fewer it, round or something? I think the idea is is that because this is uh, being used to uh, filter out for day one as part of a two-day event, you're sort of just going to have to like deal with that, and then yeah. that'll all kind of get sorted out on the best of three day two, right? Um, there is some weird stuff where... Like let's say you have you go in let's say you two o every round for the first eight rounds out of a fourteen round event right um you don't need i believe you don't need to win another game for the rest of the tournament to top eight at that point. Does that make sense i mean it's what if, like what that. if more people two o than one one and that does the math change based on just like you know just the records of those I, around you at the top or yeah, does it just kind of also, trickle down? Part of their goals for this like tournament structure is that it's really hard to make these predictive like statements because yeah. if so many people are at this point and so many people are at this point total, it's very easy for someone over the course of two or three rounds to jump up their point total a huge amount by just being on a hot streak. And it, it also means that players can't just intentionally draw because in this in this uh, structure, an intentional draw is just uh, both players conceding a game. They both like both players go, okay, I'd like to concede game one. Okay, I'll concede game two. And now you both get a match point, and that's great. Except it's possible that someone who's further down the table can jump over both of you by getting three additional points. Right. And so it makes all of this very complicated. And I actually kind of just like that. Like, a uh, thing they said in the stream is uh, we want our players to play the game, not. The- like play the tournament you know and that there's a lot to that because as someone who's participated in a bajillion magic gathering tournaments when you get to the last two rounds of the event you are always looking for a way to not have to play magic and still progress into the top eight rounds and if they find an a incentives for us to like battle those last few rounds and B make it hyper complex and basically impossible to draw ever because people can jump you out of nowhere all the time. I think that's great, but I don't know. I I'm still skeptical, skeptical about best of two, but I want to hear what David has to say. Are you a doom and gloomer or do you think this is the future of the game? Well, uh, so selfishly, I think this might be slightly bad for me, but I do think this is in general good for the game. Um, one concern that um, came up for me when Brandon was talking about uh, pulling very far ahead is um, it creates uh, different incentives for people. So um, say like there's a certain point cutoff that you believe that uh, you need to make to make day two of a given tournament or top eight of a given tournament. Um, the fact that... Uh, a 2-0 win is worth three match points versus a 1-1 win being only worth one means that there's like a lot of pressure to win both games. And at least currently, Lorcana's stance is that you cannot ask your opponent to concede. Right. Um, and so uh, as a former Magic judge, there's a lot of uh, nuance and murkiness that can happen <laughs> there when... People are trying to decide, like, are we intentionally drawing? Like, what happens if you say, like, okay, I'm conceding game one, and then your opponent says, okay, let's play game two. Like, 
you know, I, I don't know that there's any plans for enforcement of like, I, yeah. I, like I'm not even sure that I would be comfortable intentionally drawing anymore unless I like know my opponent for sure. Like, well, that's not may, inherently a bad I, thing. I think that that might just be a fictional problem. Like they'll probably come out with guidelines for the judges that say, Hey, two people can agree to a draw and you just mark it as one, one on, on the, so you, on yeah, the thing. So you, you are allowed by the Lord Connor rules currently to ask your opponent one time. I think it's per game, although it may just be at the start of the match. Yeah, it used to be to for magic one, one per game. Um, so there will be a way to uh, like draw, I believe. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so as someone who has chosen to play aggro decks in the fa- in the past, or decks that are uh, putting a lot of pressure on my opponent and attempting to get to twenty lore, uh, I historically have not had any issues finishing my matches in time, um, and I've had a large disparity where I am winning a lot going first uh, as opposed to going second. So selfishly, uh, incentivizing <laughs> players to win their game on the draw is bad for me right uh but i think good for the system as a whole so to me this feels a little bit like uh chess and uh, like in chess if you are what well, the white uh team you have an advantage uh, as as far as i know and they don't have a system uh where they play best of two they often play like best of seven best of nine whatever and they also you know don't account for the disparity of being on the play because white always gets to go first. And so I, I'm curious if the best of two is just like kind of a nod to that, where it's very clear that the way they've built the game in the engine going first is an advantage. And there's very little w- wiggle room in terms of figuring out a way around it because it's kind of baked in at this point. And when you're on the draw, if you can break serve, you get hugely rewarded and but the same is true in chess because if you win once you know you don't get stalemates and or if you get stalemates they don't hurt as badly and i and i think that that's just kind of what they're they're looking to do they're mitigating being on the draw and in doing so they are just recognizing that being on the play is a massive advantage and um and they're compensating in in their tournament structures and you're just going to see people who figure out how to win on the draw end up floating to the top and i think that that's a, a very cool thing to reward i do think in this game it it is actually like fairly challenging to play on on the draw. I think um, when I've felt like the best at Lorcana is when I'm playing a deck and I've just like figured out how to win on the draw. And so you just throw like two owing people and you're like, oh my god, I'm so good. <laughs> um, that's like a deck by deck thing. It's you know some decks I've figured it out, other decks I haven't. And uh, it's going to be very interesting to see how that plays. You know, if there's some tempo deck that just like just absolutely demolishes people on the play and then on the draw really struggles or is it the other way around? It's going to be interesting to see how that. Yeah. And I think we'll definitely see how that changes deck building as well. I think you'll see more cards that are inkable so that they're viable uh, early in the game as well as later in the game. Uh, And uh, you know, maybe it just changes how we build decks completely. Uh, Speaking speaking of, I just want to say, speaking of deck building changes, a lot of people have reacted to the people drawing, uh, by adding cards like Lucky Dime and and you know making sure they play four goats and the full bounce package as a right. way to close out the game. If you still have 50 minutes on the clock and you're only playing two matches, uh, there is less incentives to like play those sorts of cards. Yes. So I'm also curious if the result is that these decks that they get slower, are really grindy, go even slower. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. All right, cool. Yeah, I hate that. So uh, with everything in mind today, we're just going to take a few minutes. I'm going to give everyone a chance to say their piece. Um, future of the game and uh, what you thought about today's announcements. Any final words? David, hit me. So actually, one of my hot takes is that um, having variants where like a player going first is much more likely to win the game is potentially very healthy for Lurkana. Um, as someone who's played a lot of competitive card games and believes that I have an edge at tournaments, the more games that I can play in a match, the more chances I have to win and outplay my opponent. Um, and Lorcana as a card game, um, currently the mulligan is very strong and decreases variance a lot. But to have the long-term health of a card game and have new players continue to come in and have a chance to win um, is, I think, very vital for like the long-term health. And I think this announcement... Um, is potentially a really positive thing to like keep new people coming into Lorcana, but also like have Lorcana be a game that has uh, the staying power to be here for a long time. Yeah. All right, Brandon. I, I just have like a small counterpoint to that. 
Which that's is, not what we're doing. I just want to say right. one thing. No, no, no. You if have you, two minutes. Is, two minutes. You can fine. say it, but that's part fine. of your two minutes. That's fine. If you remove best of three, you're making it so that people who are need to be on the play to win have one less game where they're on the play. You know what I mean? Right. So that that also kind of counteracts like if if the better player is on the draw during a best of three match, they they're actually like losing some of their advantage, and I I think that's probably a good thing, but. It goes the other way too. Half the time, the better player gets to be on the play, and it's just like not even close. All right, feature so. of the game, big picture. Yeah. Anyway, I think this is a good change. It's at least going to be experimental. Uh, if this entire year we do this, and it turns out it was horrible for the game, I think the game can definitely survive that. Yes. Um, I don't think the competitive portion of Warcon is actually the like money maker for this game. So I think as long as it isn't toxic and the game is fun. I think we'll be fine. And I think that's where things are right now. And it looks positive for the future. Yeah. For me, uh, I, I looked at the prizes for the tournaments and I thought to myself, okay, this is scary, but I'm still going to go to both of these tournaments that they've announced. And I still want to see what everything's about. And they put the cap at 512 and it's going to sell out within an hour. And they're probably going to announce it when I'm asleep and then I'm just going to miss it. And so then I'm going to uh, holler at as many people as I can to see if I can get to do commentary for the event. Cause I think it would be a lot of fun. Um, I'm going to go to everything and I hope that uh, the lost boys are going to come with me and uh, team lost boys forever. Roll Tide and uh, Lorcan is great. And uh, thanks for being on the podcast show. And we'll see you next time.